This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Jumping into two of my past episodes today, two trading episodes, two episodes that if you're wise, they will sure as hell make you some money. Can I be that direct? I can be that direct. But you got to pay attention. You got to listen. You got to understand what the heck these two men are going to say. Because if you don't understand what they're saying, hell, you'll be right back to the Vegas casino. You'll be right back to... I don't know, twiddling your thumbs, sitting in your mom's basement in your tidy whities watching porn. Who knows what you're going to do? But for those of you interested in some great trading insights, I offer today two guests. Jack Schwager, famed author of the Market Wizards series, one of his later interviews on this show discussing his book, Unknown Market Wizards. And Eric Crittenden, a trend-following trader. That's all I got to say. I mean... I could say a lot more about Eric, and you're going to hear the conversation, but he's a trend-following trader, and that's kind of what I do too. So there you go. Jump right in. Two great voices, two inspirational voices, two voices that will make you smarter, again, if you pay attention. Stop drinking, no drugs, no weird behavior. Listen. Listen. Do I sound a little strange today? I don't know. I'm in a good mood today. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my two guests today. I hope you enjoy. My guest today is no stranger to this show. He is one of those voices that helped me to launch this show. Even if it was not intentional, he gave me his time. He allowed me to ask him questions. He gave great answers. My guest today is Jack Schwager. He is the author of Market Wizards, New Market Wizards, Hedge Fund Market Wizards, Stock Market Wizards, and today, Unknown Market Wizards. The cool thing about Jack, even though you may have read all of those other titles, and I have, this new one fits like a glove. It's a natural extension. It's fresh. It's interesting. It makes you go, wow, what is going on? How did I not know about this? Yeah. In 2020, after all of these years, Jack has the ability with the pen and the interview to make you take notice. Now that's damn cool. Without any further delay, let's jump right in and talk a little unknown market wizards with Jack Schwager. Jack, there's a couple big picture things I want to talk about out of the gate before we dive into your newest work. Things about you, your writing style, how you create your books. I know from experience, having gone through your books, that the people, the traders that are often in your books can have very strong political opinions. Now, we are in the political season. But I think what's so interesting about your book, and I actually, from memory, I would say it's often pretty divided. You're going to have guys, it's not discussed in your book, and that's going to be my point in a second, but you're going to have guys on different sides of the political spectrum in your book. But what I find so interesting about your books in a day and age where there's so much polarization, people at a human level really don't hate each other that much. But I love the fact that you keep it at the content. You keep it at the trading. And ultimately, trading, what you write about, is not political. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly true. Yeah, it's not political in terms of right or left. Certainly, I've interviewed traders on that run the spectrum from really extreme right, like somebody like Monroe Trout, who's uh, Ayn Rand proponent, or he was, I'm sure he still is, on the liberal side, Dennis, for example, or others. It runs the spectrum and it doesn't, political views don't really make any difference. Although I will say I did have one 
line in my book. I actually said nothing to do with politics, but I said, I bet that if Trump was a traitor, he'd be awful because he never admits he's wrong. I don't know if you consider that a political statement. I just consider it a factual statement. It's nice because I think with so much polarization out there that when you can pick up a work and you can find yourself, and I did with your newest book, Unknown Market Wizards, you just find yourself getting engrossed in something and it's more about the learning or the experience or the storytelling. And you don't have to feel as America gets more and more divided. None of that stuff plays a role. And so I commend you for taking that high ground because I think less and less people are. It is tempting for me sometimes to express opinions in that regard. But, well, you actually picked the use of a very interesting word. And I think I'm glad to hear you say it, which is storytelling. Of course, my main aim is to provide stuff that's useful for traders. And I think the books do that. But that's not a big deal, or it is a big deal, but it's certainly nowhere near enough. You also have to make the book readable, entertaining. I think the reason the books, the Mark Wizard books have been successful is because I paid a lot of attention to that side of it, not just the trading side, because otherwise they could have been pretty boring books. I think when I picked up Unknown Market Wizards, I could have immediately transported myself to picking up Market Wizards for the first time and just continuing the read, continuing the storytelling, in the sense that if one liked Market Wizards and all your stuff, and obviously a lot of people do, this is just a natural pickoff. It's quite amazing because how many decades difference are we talking right here? Over three. It feels exactly the same. That's a real skill to keep what you built and created and then find all these new players and keep that same ethos moving forward. It's really cool. Oh, thanks. Another big picture point here. I can think back to the first time as someone who knew very little picking up the market wizards. Unknown market wizards is dense. I see a lot of books for this trading podcast. I mean, for this podcast, Beyond Trading. And a lot of books today, a lot of business books today are two or 300 pages built around one great idea. Your books have never been like that. I know this sounds like I'm kissing your butt. I want to express it to people because it's so true. You cannot pick up a Market Wizards book and just read it without thinking. <laughs> you force us to think. Once in a while, I'll go and look at reviews in the books. You know, yeah, most times, the reviews are very good, and mostly fives and so forth. But once in a while, you get the one star. They make me laugh because the one stars are invariably something along the line they're complaining there wasn't a system or an exact way to trade put out on a silver tray for them. Just completely missed the whole point of the book, which is that's not what makes successful trading. It's not a cookbook recipe. You do one, two, three, four, five. You use this moving average and you never buy on Tuesdays or whatever rules you want to make up. But people sometimes look for that and they kind of don't even know what the right question is. My focus really is on the things that are not a recipe per se, but they have a lot of insight and useful information. You just have to kind of apply it to your approach and think about it. It's an interesting point about the one star folks. I would think that they could have the ability to, if they feel like they've got this criticism, to stop for a second and say, hold on, what am I missing? Why is this guy, Jack, getting this opportunity to talk to all these traders? Why do they trust him? Why are they saying what they're saying? What am I missing, right? I mean, I think that's one of the tricks with a, with a lot of books is if you really want to criticize it, but a lot of other people love it, you almost got to step back and say, hey, what, what am I not seeing here? Hey, we're only talking a very small minority. I don't know, it's a couple of percent out of maybe two out of every hundred readers or something like that. But they're probably complete beginners and kind of go in with the idea that, oh, yeah, this is a good way I can spend an hour a week and make a million dollars a year. And this book is going to tell me how to do it. In the preface of this book, I basically say, if you are expecting to find step-by-step -step instructions on how to make 100% a year in the markets, with only two hours of work a week, quick, put this book down. You've got the wrong book. That's my message right out front. That's not what this book is. Let me talk in one more big picture point about finding people, finding market wizards to put in a book like this. Now, I know a guy like you, you've got a lot of experience with a lot of strategies. You also have a lot of experience with performance data. So I'm sure, and you might even have a story about this, that you've had some very credible person at some point in time, maybe more than one, approach you with a track record and a little jack due diligence pulled on a string. And the next thing you know, it all fell apart. 
So as somebody like you, you've got to kind of look at that track record. You've got to understand the strategy. But why don't you speak to the idea of confirmation, how you go about making sure that these market wizards are legit? It's a real process, isn't it? Yeah, true story and relates to this book. About a year, year and a half ago, I get this email from a fellow and he says, this may be sound hard to believe, but I turned the $3,000 account into $50 million and I've kind of sort of been on my own and never had any exposure or whatever, but I'm kind of thinking maybe I would like to share my story. You get that type of email, first thing you think is, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not going to prejudge without having given a person a chance. But I basically say, look, I'm not looking to write another book right now. But I'll keep your, you know, your email on file in case I change my mind. And, and it so turned out nine months later or whatever, I did decide to do this book. So I wrote him back and I say, your email was quite interesting. Of course, I need to confirm it. Uh, send me your statements. And sure enough, I mean, he, he had statements back to, I think, about 2009 monthly statements. But before then, for whatever reason, I think a different broker or, or the records didn't go back. He didn't, so I said, okay, send me your tax statements, end of year statements, but enough. Maybe you have the end of year, not the monthly. I, I, I did so many of these, I forget which is which. But anyway, he's totally confirmed his performance. And actually this year, he's taken at 50 and he's over 80 million. He may be coming up on 100 million. I don't know. You can't go with somebody like that and just say, okay, send me a performance. I send you an Excel spreadsheet. Wow, that's great. You really have to confirm it because some of these, actually, I mean, it's true of all the traders. There are traders in this book where... They've got, let's say, 12 years, 13 years of average return of 300% annually. I mean, you can't possibly believe those up in numbers unless you really physically see the statements. And, and they were good about getting me all the statements. Is there a side of you? And look, I'm talking to somebody who's probably the most renowned guy in the world for interviewing top traders. Is there still a side of you, even when you see statements with Bernie Madoff and the rearview mirror that you still kind of feel like, gosh, how can I trust? Is there an extra step that you have to do? Or is it using all the experience you have to kind of understand their method? I think Madoff, if I remember correctly, had his own kind of brokerage. So if it was some unknown type of brokerage, I haven't run across that. But if it was, that would be a red flag. In this case, some of them were like Ameritrade. And I kind of know Ameritrade because I have an account. There was always known brokers. And there wasn't a case where I interviewed someone where he couldn't confirm it. I mean, he only had statements for the last year, last year and a half, and it was a Canadian, it was a Canadian firm. The brokerage statements were terrible, and he didn't supply back, and he didn't. I decided there wasn't just enough verification there. I couldn't use it. And you can tell, I mean, what a real statement looks like from a real firm. I mean, I guess it's possible for somebody to counterfeit something and elaborately and stuff, but. That would be an awful lot of trouble to go through counterfeiting hundreds of statements, monthly statements to get in a book. After interviewing these people, you sort of get a sense as well that, that they're the real thing. You did not expect, going back three decades to the classic first book with all these names that were either huge then or became even bigger, you did not expect with this book to find performance that matched or exceeded, but you did. Yeah. You're paraphrasing what I said in the beginning of the book. The biggest surprise I had in the book, doing this book, was the performance of people I found because I kind of assumed a number of things which weren't true, but I assumed that the records of people like Marcus and Kovner and Paul Tudor Jones and Trout and so forth, in those early years when I was interviewing them in the 80s, we're talking about records that would go 70s, 80s type of thing. But I assumed those records were set in the time where a number of these traders were, if not technical trend following, trend oriented. You know, we had these massive trends in those in those in that period, partially due to the inflationary period. A number of factors coming together. Back then, trend following, you would know better than anyone else. You go back in the 70s, you know, there weren't that many people doing it. This is pre-PC and so forth. So I kind of assumed that those records were set under special circumstances. Moreover, what you've also had in the interim is this massive increase in computer power and this uh, uh, sort of wave of quants entering finance. Physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, astronomers. But all these people, very, very strong quant skills. And you have firms, as you know, many firms with scores or even hundreds of PhD quants. So I kind of assume 
those phenomenal returns, you can't do two, 300% a year anymore. It's just not possible. So my biggest surprise was to find, yes, you can. And there are people in here that their performance might be the guy I mentioned who took, actually was 2,500 into what is now 80 million. I mean, Marcus was phenomenal because he took 20,000 into 80 million. He took 2,500 into 80 million. So I was able to find people who had extraordinary performance. And it just says that despite all of the changes we've seen and all the computer power and all the PhDs in it, there's still a place for the, and we're talking solo traders. They don't have staffs or anything, just one guy in his computer. They have been able to put up extraordinary numbers for over a decade in most cases. I'm going to take you through some names for some highlights. I really want to implore people because it would not do the book justice if I just sat here and tried to go line by line and say, Jack, tell me about that. I mean, it is really a storytelling book and it's many, many stories, fantastic stories of trading success. So I really implore people to check that out. I'm curious from your perspective though, and this can apply to your current book or the whole series of the Market Wizards books. You get in, you've talked about the process of looking at performance. You start to understand what that particular trader is doing, at least what they're telling you. You probably got a lot of experience yourself. You're looking at the performance. You're looking at what they say. You're trying to match things up. How do you generally come down on the side of knowing when it's all said and done what that particular trader is doing? I'm sure for many traders, you figured out or they told you exactly what they're doing. Are there some though, and perhaps even in this book, where even you see the performance, even they tell you what they're doing, you're still scratching your head a little bit, kind of going, I wonder what their real sauce is, so to speak. I don't think I ever did an interview that I put in a book. I've done interviews that I've left out of the book. <laughs> I don't use all the interviews I do. But the interviews that I do put in the book, I always have to answer the question of how are they doing it? It has to be clear. The methodology, either the trader himself explains it or I explain it in a summary or both how the trader is doing it. Now, even though I'm telling readers what they're doing, doesn't mean you can do it. You can learn from it. You can get ideas from it. In some cases, people are able to somewhat duplicate things. In most cases, the traders have some extraordinary innate skill. It's not enough to just know what the techniques they're using. That's only part of the source. The rest of it is their tremendous ability to apply that efficiently. One of the traders I mentioned who make 300% a year tells you quite clearly what he does. He basically focuses on major market events like central bank announcements, et cetera. And he really prepares himself so he knows in and out what the possibilities are, what he's going to do under any circumstance, both for when the news comes out, what it is, and both how the market reacts to it. For every possibility, he knows what he does. And then he mentally rehearses that and he meditates and he prepares like an athlete before a big event. He's sitting there knowing exactly what he's going to do with his hand in the mouse and the report comes out, no matter what it has, he's got an instantaneous reaction. And usually with a large order, unless it's something which is completely neutral and there's no trade. But if there's any opportunity in his mind, he's ready instantaneously to take the trade. And if he's wrong, he'll be out in a minute. Is this Amrit Saul? Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> so the description is good. You already pop up with the name. So exactly. Amrit exudes confidence, by the way. And he's also... I got cross verification. Two of the traders I interviewed, the three of them were in the same prop shop at one time or another. Hamrick was a senior guy. So he at one point or another tutored the others, not tutored them point of developing their, their, their methodology and style, but giving them advice that was useful. In one case, he, one trader, he saved the trader's job because the firm was thinking of possibly letting him go. And he said, no, this guy's going to be good. And of course he was right. Unicorn Sniper. Yeah. In two words, I have to describe what his, and he describes himself. He says he's been told, and when he said he's been called by people who know how he trades, uh, Unicorn Sniper, and he talks about himself that way. He's just looking for those isolated events where there's tremendous potential and limited risk relative to the potential, and then he takes a shot. If he's trading for sort of trades that don't quite make the cut or trading when he shouldn't. I mean, those are all mistakes in his mind. If he's doing it right, he's just taking not that many trades, but when he takes the trades, there's like a potential for an enormous payoff. He can make 25, 50% in a day or even more. In fact, I think it was him or 
one of the other guys that had a 100% day. Now that people are going to say, oh, well, they must be taking a huge amount of risk. Well, the point is, yeah, if he held the position, it could lose all his money. But he is so disciplined in his risk control that he will never make that mistake. And if the market doesn't act exactly the way he thinks it should in response to something, then he's wrong and he's out. So he cuts his loss very, very quickly. Let's go to a word that you brought up earlier, and it's a really important word. It's in your preface. It's across your book. It's really kind of the background here, and it's the word solo. You and I right now are, quote, solo in many ways. I started to experience this solo concept in the 90s, and I just loved it. I loved, I needed to work with people if I needed to on assorted projects. Okay. But I love that sense of being solo. I didn't want you know, a thousand employees or whatnot. I guess if I stumbled into the Amazon, I would have gone the Jeff Bezos direction. Why not, right? But I think for most people, the bell curve, solo is one of our best options. And I think that's what's so motivational about what you've written with this book is it reminds people. You can have all the excuses about, well, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to be with such and such. Well, not really. If you really just focus on it and you put a lot of time and effort in, you might not be like the guys in your newest book. You might not get that big or whatnot. But solo is an important word in this day and age. With all this technology, you really have the chance to be a solo person and do big things. You're picking up on a key theme in the book, and it's very similar to other market wizards in many ways. But what makes it different is I went out on the onset to find people Well, the unknown and solo are almost synonymous. I was looking for this image I had that there were people globally, and you can appreciate that having relocated to Vietnam and stuff like that. So there are people globally who are just kind of really good traders and just trading their own account. Nobody knows who they are. They never manage money. That's what I was trying to find. And that goes with the solo concept. Do you think most of those folks knew it in the beginning of their success or just appreciated it later on that they were solo? If you take 3,000 to 50 million and you're still solo, man, what's the point of joining a group at that point in time? You've got all the freedom in the world. You can make your own choices. You don't need all that other stuff. Yeah. I think for the most part, they just started that way and it just worked well. And I think a few of them might entertain managing money probably carefully under the rights. But I think if they manage money, It'll probably end up being the same type of thing. They might take one large account or something like that, or a couple. In fact, one of the traders does. It's kind of an exception that he still solely trades on his own. He doesn't want to. He did try going the other way. He, he did have a situation where he joined a hedge fund and had a large allocation. And I think he had like 500 million, 600 million at his maximum point. But he found that he just didn't like marketing. The staff was always trying to get him to go out marketing. He didn't want to do that. He just ultimately just cut it off and went back to solo trading. And now he's taking a few accounts, but accounts he knows, they're just single large accounts. People don't bother him. And so he's just trading few accounts alongside of his. He doesn't want any employees. Absolutely. He will not let himself get into a situation where he needs to have employees. Do you find most of these guys for this particular book were introverted? Certainly some. As a generality, maybe more so than for most of the books I've done. I wouldn't say they were all introverted, but to some extent, I think that may be more of a commonality. But I I don't know. Typically, I spend just a day with these people, sometimes two. It's hard to judge. And usually, nobody, if they're really introverted, I won't be able to use the interview. I kind of need people that are willing to talk and open up. It's almost guesswork for me to say whether in general they're introverted. I always say with introversion and extroversion, as an introvert, and I am, I can go stand on a stage and speak to a thousand people in mainland China. But when it's over, I don't want to be around anybody. I want to be by myself and recharge my batteries that way. Whereas the extrovert's like, let's go party. Yeah, probably more than the introvert. And I'm probably similar to you in the same way. I could get in front of an audience. I'm very, very comfortable with any larger, the better. In fact, I'm very happy to speak to people I know, but The thing I hate most in the world is probably a cocktail party. (laughs) There you go. Probably somebody. Okay, I got a name for you, and I hope I don't mess this name up. Daljit Dalliwal. There's a story in the book. I'll let you run with it. He talks about meeting Ray Dalio. They talk about expected value, space, and the ocean. 
The floor is yours. Tell the story. It's a cool story. Daljit, a big hero of his was Dalio. One day, he sees that Dalio is offering to sell lunch with him for the highest bidder. So he says, great, I'm going to bid for this. And he goes on and he sees he was expecting to pay a lot, really a lot of money. And he sees the bids are only like 10000 He said, well, that's, I'll do that. He kept on bidding and sort of near the end of this auction, whatever it was, he's still he's the high bidder at something like 50000 I think, or something close to that. He had to leave the office and take the London tube going home. And it was kind of right near the end of the auction. And he gets out. First thing he does as soon as he got reception on his iPhone he looks to see if he's the final bid and somebody beat him and he's like beating himself up. He said, I should have been there. I should put in the last bid. He's so beating himself up because he missed what for him was this big opportunity to meet Dalio. And then it turns out the next day to call him and he said, Dalio is offered to do a second lunch. And he was the second highest bidder. And so he took that right away. So he went to have lunch with, with Dalio. By the way, he couldn't remember anything. He doesn't know if he ever ate anything or, or certainly what was there. To him, this was like a thrill of a life. One of the things that you mentioned is the thing about space. And he got the kind of, you know, just mentioning things that he got from Dalio. It was the idea that the non-obvious thing is not really necessarily the best way to go and just a proper way to analyze the situation. So he said, we spend so much money going out to space in different ways and exploration. And there's nothing wrong with that per se, but you could achieve so much more scientifically by spending a fraction of that amount of money in ocean research. And that was just kind of just the like a different way of thinking that what seems I you, know, you think of exploration, the new frontiers, you think space, but hey, a lot of the ocean is unexplored and it's probably a bigger payoff, much bigger payoff for the same amount of money, what that same money would get you in space exploration. So that was particularly just like one angle. One thing he told me, I was asking things he learned from Dalio, he just mentioned that as an example. Kind of that mindset shift. I mean, I look at where I'm at right now. I still scratch my head. I know the reasons why America is not putting really big investment into Vietnam. But my gosh, it's kind of like the ocean in a way. You know, people look at the space and space is talking about China, but Vietnam is 100 million people. And generally they love America, which is crazy in of itself. I can't really explain it completely, but they do. They're perhaps the most capitalistic country in the world, which is, again, hard to explain. But you would just think of all the places where there's opportunity we often don't look at the things that are the smartest move. We keep focused on the big blinking light, so to speak. That's another good example of the same lesson. Yeah. Okay. One of your favorites. And there's so many ways we can go with him. He's been on this show, been around for a long time. A lot of people know him, big following on Twitter. I think you guys, I'm guessing you guys have known each other for a long time, pretty decent friends, I think. And this would be Peter Brandt. Yeah, we're definitely friends. We know each other. At this point, actually, we met maybe eight years ago or so, first time, seven years ago. Neither one of us could remember if we had crossed paths before. We kind of knew of each other. There's a lot of similarities in the way we think and so forth. I mean, about markets and trading. In fact, I remember this, and it might have been, I think it might have been your broadcast. I think it was. So you had Peter on, and I'm listening to it, and you ask him questions. And mentally, I kind of answer the question. And damn, if Peter doesn't answer it the same way almost every time. That really struck me, but I knew him, and I wasn't surprised, really. But hearing it, you're interviewing him, like I say, I'm mentally thinking what my answer would be, and it's like listening to myself in some ways. I always thought he had great, not only great lessons about trading, but very succinct ways of putting it, very colorful ways of putting it. I kind of regretted I never interviewed him for a Market Wizards book. And I said, if I ever do another Wizards book, he's got to be in it. And in fact, he was the catalyst for this book because Peter lived in Colorado, as I do, a couple of hours away. He was going to be moving and I knew he was going to be moving. And I was thinking of doing a book, this book at some point, but I wasn't sure when. He mentioned he was moving and in a couple of months. I said, well, I should do Peter's interview anyway. I'll probably do the book in not that distant future. I should do it before he moves. Well, anyway, by the time I got around, we got around to scheduling it. He had moved. I had to fly to meet with him anyway. But that was the catalyst. And, and he's also the exception in that these traders are almost all of them are totally unknown. Peter, because he has this Twitter following, particularly, and I mean, he had the market letter that he put out, but that subscriber base was not that large. So before he started doing, before his Twitter following really exploded a couple of years ago, he still was completely unknown or relatively unknown. By the time I got around to doing the interview, he was known 
at least to people who followed him on Twitter. I made an exception and I explained why I said really felt important. First of all, he is still a solo trader. He kind of still fits that way. He's never managed money except for a very short period of time, which is in a book, the reason why. And he's still kind of unknown to the investment world, basically. He was close enough, but more importantly, I wanted to get his thoughts and ideas and advice in the book. I literally wanted to preserve it. I love the one line. You're probably even going to guess which one it is that he says, I'm my own worst enemy. What's so nice about that in this day and age where so many people are either conflicted or confused, they don't know how to get from point A to B, they don't know the right mentors to follow. When Peter says something like that, it's just such a personal responsibility statement. Things are not fair in the world. Things don't work out for everyone. Things are a mess. But even if things are a mess, and I see this and having traveled and you know, see it in countries where far less developed than America, walk down the street and you see somebody hustling and you can tell that they hustle that street corner every day selling something. You know, It could be a piece of fruit or whatnot. I love that Peter says he's his own worst enemy. It's just such a nice personal responsibility statement. Yeah, it is. And it's also kind of ties in with his whole philosophy, which in fact, I think I used this for the chapter title, Strong Opinions Weekly Held, to the point that, yeah, when he puts on a trade, he has a definite opinion. He's looking for something to happen. But if it doesn't go the way he thinks it's going to go, he'll be out right away. He has no loyalty or to his original opinion. The odd thing is, or not so odd, actually, he will get criticized on Twitter because people will say, people always want to show, hey, this guy isn't really that good. They want to, <laughs> looking for excuses to show people up who are good. Somebody will say something like, Peter recommended shorting the S&P when it was like a thousand points lower or whatever. What he doesn't say is he changed his mind like one day later. The point is that he's not tied to whatever opinion he has. Yes, he has a strong opinion at any point in time, but it can change in an instant. And that goes with the idea that he knows he's fallible and therefore he has to react to what the market is telling him, not to think that he's right. Jack, I know you're a really fair-minded guy. I don't think you have any bias. I think you go where the data shows you to go. That's my understanding. I think that's a fair comment. I don't know off the top of my head if women have been featured in the Wizards series, but I know if there have been, it's been a very small number. What would you tell women listeners if they want to start to think about or approach? Have you ever thought about how one can bridge the gap to get women to understand certain traits or perspectives or ways of being that these market wizard guys the direction they go. Is there any advice you can give women on what they can learn from some of these market wizard guys? Well, advice I would say, uh, if they have an inclination to go into trading, they should, because I would bet, and this is just a guess, but if you took 500 men and 500 women and gave them the opportunity to trade, they were all people who wanted to do it. I would bet there would be more successful women than men, because men have a lot of traits that are inherent to our sex, of, which are not conducive to good trading. And women, I think, have some traits which are more common for women than men. So men may try to bully things, try to show, I'm not going to let the market win. I'm not going to let the market beat me. More inclination, I think, to be stubborn, probably. And women, I think, probably better on intuition than men. Maybe that's a biased statement. I don't know, but it feels true. Now, I've had a couple of women over the course of the books. I would love to have more. Trouble is, Take this book, for example. So some traders on Fundseeder, our site Fundseeder, none of them were women. I put out a few inquiry tweets asking if you know anybody who's, if you or you know somebody who is a phenomenal trader, let me know because I'm doing a book on solo traders, unknown traders, and I'm interested in any suggestions. I got literally, I don't know how many hundreds, but many, many hundreds of recommendations. I cannot recall getting a single woman recommendation, or if there was, it didn't fit for some reason. You wanted to include, I'm sure. Yeah. I did have one woman that I did interview. It was actually a very good interview, and I wanted to use it, but I did it because I was in London. She had been recommended as a great day, but she is a hedge fund manager, and it just didn't fit the theme of the book. It's also her approach was a bit arcane for a number of reasons, but she had a very good story, and I'm 
kind of think that maybe at some point in the future I, I would include it. So the fact that she was a woman was all the more reason I wanted to include it, but it just didn't fit the book. I'm going to shift gears on you to two movies really quick. The traitor that you feature in your book, I'm not sure if I'm guessing right here, you might have already mentioned him, but two movies that I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of The Wolf of Wall Street. I'm seeing DiCaprio selling penny stocks. I'm also thinking of Ben Affleck and Boiler Room giving this speech to all these penny stock salesmen. And I think most people, probably you included, when you hear penny stocks, you think the pink sheets going back in time, a little bit of like, oh, but you have a story in this book that sort of <laughs> rocks that foundation, huh? Obviously, talking about Jeff Newman, for reference, this is the same trade we talked about going from 2,500 to what is now 80 million plus. He started with penny stocks because saw that's where the biggest moves were. That's where you could make the... God, he went in with some crazy assumption. He was shooting to make a million in his first year. He figured out how much he had to make every day to compound to a million. Penny stocks were the only way he saw that he could do this. The odd thing is, my impression of penny stocks and yours, I don't know much about them really, but whatever I do know about it, I can always think it's like a scam, a pump and dump scheme and all of that. The thing about Jeff, though, of course, he doesn't have any inside information or know anything. Almost everybody who goes into penny stocks will lose money. But he did phenomenally well because where Jeff's real skill is picking up on things early on, on trends, whether it might be marijuana beverages or things like that. Basically, they're just technologies where they're still early on and will pick up and there's a lot of hype and he'll ride that and he'll get out. He has very, very good skills at getting out before it all collapses. I think the trade you're talking about was sponge tech, right? Is that the one you're thinking of? Just more in general than just his overall strategy of going into penny stocks. He would see something. We mentioned the uh, cannabis beverages. So he saw this as an early trend. He tells a story, and this kind of gives a feel for what he always has to kind of try as well. He goes into the largest beverage store in his region. Texas. And he speaks to the manager about how is this selling? And it was a particular one. And he says, this is amazing. I was living in pain for all these years and I started drinking this stuff. Just incredible. Seeing that type of feedback. So he got into that early and was doing really well. And because he kept on revisiting the store, just one day he comes in, this manager runs over to him. He says, I got to tell you this. They recalled all the stock because they found some debris in and so he went right home and, and sold everything. Even though the thing completely collapsed, he had this great profit. As you point this out, someone could say that was just luck. Yeah. But so many times, the luck is because you've done the work to be lucky, to be in the right spot. If he wasn't there talking to managers and visiting the store, he never would have seen it. So yeah, it's luck. But he made his own luck in that respect. Jack, I showed up at an event in Chicago, I think in 94, and you were speaking on the days with a couple other market wizards. I mean, someone could say, well, that was luck, Mike. You went there and got inspired. Well, I don't know if it was luck or not, but I had to go. All of our lives are kind of like that. You got to pull on the string. And if you keep pulling on the string, crazy stuff happens. I'm a believer, by the way, that a lot of success, I attribute whatever success I've had, is certainly luck plays an important role. I mean, the first job I got, I never knew anything about futures. I wrote my way into the job, but I didn't know what futures were. I didn't know that was going to be my career. So it was kind of lucky that I put an ad into the New York Times then had seeking positions wanted, not employers looking for jobs, but people who were looking to get hired. I put in a $15 ad just saying basic skills were, and I'm looking for an analytical job. And it worked. It was just a fluke that the director of research happened to pick up, you know, hey, Michael Marcus was leaving that job. And just happened to be looking that day, and I happened to have my head in then. My whole career was luck in that respect, but I could have been lucky to get in and then not have the skill to do anything with it. It's a combination of both, but I believe that luck plays a more important role in many people's success than they typically are willing to admit. Jack, all these new, I guess not new traders, but these kind of solo unknown wizards in this new book. Has anything shaken your belief in some classic risk management? For example, something like very basic and straightforward, a stop loss. Is there any aspect across all these different strategies, all these different traders, and you can go beyond this book. Do we ever get to the point where a stop loss becomes something that people need to question 
gosh, should I really have a stop loss? Or is that in your experience across the timeframes, across the traders, across the strategies, they all got a stop loss? I think risk management, one rare exception I can think of, it wasn't in this book. Risk management is essential and stop losses are a key way of doing it, but not the only way. So somebody like Amrit we talked about before may not have a stop in right instantaneously. He may or may not, but not necessarily. But he's disciplined enough to know that he'll pull the trigger to get out right away. And you have to have sort of absolute discipline to do that. You don't necessarily have to stop loss. It's the easiest way to probably accomplish risk management, but it's not the only way. I think all the people in this book exercise extremely strong risk discipline. That's why you get these very large returns, but their maximum drawdowns tend to be small. Other than people who early in the career lacked risk management, so I'm thinking of somebody like Jason Shapiro, but learn from that and learn what they were doing was exactly what a bad trader does, and you have to do the exact opposite. We then go on and see his old traits and other people and almost use them as contrary indicators. But once these people hit their successful style, at least all the people in this book have very strong risk management. The question you asked, if you had asked it me, like, and you may have, I don't know, last time we did speak in the last wizard book, Hedge Fund Market Wizards, there was one trader in there that kind of blew apart everything I believed in and, and everything almost every trader ever said about risk control because he was almost to an eye like a reckless trader and it was to me miraculous he didn't blow up but he was the type of trader who would just go into just trade against trends when they got extreme he would trade against a trend all the way as the stock went up but he still managed to do okay because well better than okay when whatever he was short and the stock was going up whenever it had a dip he'd buy back a portion of it and then sell it again higher and he was so good at kind of reaping these small little profits that even when he was dead wrong in the trend, he still came out ahead. But I tried to convince him that if he just flipped it around and traded, used this reaping profits, but went with the way the general trend was going, it would be easier and better. He couldn't do it because he had to be fighting. He had to be fighting other people. That was his personality. He's an exception. And I said in that particular chapter, don't try this at home. You mentioned Jason Shapiro. There was one little side nugget in the setup for that interview that caught my eye. I sometimes deal with it on this podcast, occasionally in my books. I think I've encountered it. He talked about wanting approval for the interview. You essentially said, well, you know, I'm paraphrasing. I got a little bit of a track record here. I tend to make people look pretty good, or at least I'm honest about it. I'm kind of putting the truth out there. And but he kind of was a little hesitant. And I had someone the other day, they approached me about a podcast and I was not familiar with this person, but I saw the the name and uh, I saw the book and I was like, well, sure, I'll have them on. Then they came back to me and they said, well, you give us approval. And I said, no, I'm not giving you approval. I said, you come on, you can look at my track record and this is not 60 minutes. I'm not looking to hurt you. But why don't you speak to that notion of sometimes people being a little unsure about having their name in print or their ideas in print? That happens. Shapiro is a low, somebody who wants to be off the radar screen and said, I think he contacted me, but it wasn't to be in the book. When he talked about some of the things that he'd done or whatever, and it sounded interesting, I'm hesitant to say this, but it's the basic fact of why this happened. He went from being unsuccessful to successful. But anyway, earlier in his career, he went down to a bookstore. He was in Hong Kong then and looking for a book on trading. He happened to pick up the original Market Wizards. And that book was to him kind of that convinced me he wanted to be a trader and was kind of inspirational. He was coming to Colorado. He was coming to Boulder, where I live, at least most of the year. I also have another residence in Colorado. He was coming for a wedding. So he said, yeah, I'd like to kind of get together. That's okay. I said, sure. Would you be open interviewing you just in case it is good? You know, it makes good copy. He went back and forth and signed it. He wasn't sure. Ended up coming to my home office just no, I don't want to. I just don't want anybody to know me. I don't want any publicity. I talked to him for a couple of hours and I didn't have the re recording on, which was, and he had so, all these great stories. Once I was working on a book, I sent him another email. I said, Hey, Jason, I really think you have some great ideas and some great stories. And I think it'd really be good to include you in the book. And it went back and forth and he didn't want it. And then I know I sent him some stuff. And, and then he ends up saying, No, nah, I, I I'm sorry, you know, respect what you do, but I just don't want to do it. Then I sent them some short thing, I don't know, a short email back. Or, and he says, oh, screw it, let's just do it. 
I interviewed him again this time by phone, but I already had spent time with him in person. And of course, this was, I don't remember if we were into the uh, virus, maybe not. But in any case, we did the interview by phone, kind of the same stories and stuff that we had talked about when we met. You don't think about it because it's part of your nature. But somebody might say, well, Jack, getting that particular interview was lucky. But not really, because there was just a, a persistence without being pushy that was taking place over time. And then something just trips in the interviewee. This has happened to me as well, too. You're not really bugging people, but it's just kind of they're getting to know you. And then one day it just happens. But it's not really luck. It's a process. I had to do that follow up a few months later and say, hey, your story was great. Would you reconsider? Yeah. Hey, one last thought, Jack. A lot of people will look at the big picture news and they'll hear about high frequency trading and they'll think, oh my gosh, JP Morgan or some big shop and they're making all this money every day trading the speed of light, a warehouse full of servers. There's no opportunity for me. Well, isn't your book, the new book, isn't it just proof positive that maybe you can't be the exact traders and have the exact success of the guys in your newest book, but it sure proves there's opportunity. I think I end the book basically that maybe the most important message is it is still possible to be enormously successful. Realistically, most people won't, of course. But these people show that the opportunity is still there. It is still possible. I'll be the first one to admit that for most people, they'll be better off putting money in a stock index and leaving it there for 30 years. But if you're somebody who doesn't have an edge, who doesn't have a strong desire to trade, you don't have a particular skill then yeah, that's what you should do, the opposite of what I'm writing about. But for those people who have a passion for it, try it and seem to develop a methodology that has an edge, the opportunities are still there. The book, Unknown Market Wizards, the best traders you've never heard of. Other books, Market Wizards, New Market Wizards, Hedge Fund Market Wizards, Stock Market Wizards. Did I miss one? Yeah, those are all the, the standard format wizard books. I did that little book of Market Wizards, which was kind of my little narrative of some of the key lessons. Cool stuff, Jack. Always enjoy talking. And I know we'll talk again because you're not going to stop writing. You're going to do more cool stuff, I'm sure. No, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, oh. always think, I, think, I always think every book is my last one, but I've kind of been doing that for decades. So I don't know, but it, it's certainly a possibility. I always like our interviews because you kind of ask different questions as Sometimes you get a little bored because people ask the same questions and you always take the conversation in different directions. And do I now have the record of most appearances on your podcast? You or Tom Basso? You might be tied. I'll have to go back and check now because your first one was in 2013, I believe, for Hedge Fund Market Wizards, but there's been a lot in between. Look, I'm over 900 episodes now, just past 10 million listens. That's really kind of crazy. And I have to thank you. Look, if you and guys like Tom did not come on early on and give some appearance credibility, I probably could not have gone out and asked someone like Daniel Kahneman to come on. You had to build a little steam behind you to get other people to come on. So, Yeah, you've done very well, Nobel Prize winners and everything. Hey, where can we send people? You're on Twitter. There, Obviously, your books are all on Amazon. Fun Cedar is one of your sites. Is there anywhere else you would like to send people? It's actually jackswager.com. I'm kind of a little, uh, I don't have devotion to keeping it up to date on everything, but people can find some old podcasts there and some, a few articles and uh, a number of articles. You just made me think because as a guy who asks questions too, I'm quite happy that you say that I ask different questions because you're a guy that asks questions, so you don't want to hear the same old shit all the time. I try to go with the conversation. I, I try to have a conversation and let it go where it goes. I hate the idea of coming in, and I think that they read deadly. If you come in with a, a list of pre prepared questions, I sometimes hear this on podcasts and they're unlistenable. I don't really read interviews very often, but if you read it, but you can kind of tell it's like, person will answer it, raises some really interesting point, and then they'll ask another unrelated question because they're just going through their checklist and it's deadly. So I've learned in my life, there's two ways to learn. You, you either learn from people who do things correctly and trying to learn from them, or you do learn from people who do things really poorly and just do the opposite. In terms of interviewing style, seeing how poor that is, is kind of a reinforcement of doing it differently. So you have enough intuition to know that I had no written questions down before this podcast. No, I know you don't. And it doesn't sound like that. You do what I do in my books. You have a conversation. Probably better than I do because if I transcribe my 
actual conversation, it would be like, well, first of all, the, each interview would be like a book and it would be too long. But the only reason my interviews work is I have the, the luxury of being able to extract and, and shape it and, and all of that. If I did a literal transcription of it, it would be terrible. So you're able to do podcasts that list, that are quite listenable on the first take. So that's not my skill. Jack, cool stuff. Thanks for the nice words. And again, thank you for all your work. I know you, there's millions, literally millions. I know we've talked about this before. There's got to be well over a million copies in total of all the Market Wizards books. And that's it's just phenomenal. I think anybody else that's written a trading book or an investing book, they're just saying, gosh, I hope I can pass that guy Jack one day. You got a big head start on everybody. <laughs> yeah, I never know how many copies sell in places like China and all of that. Foreign sales are kind of odd. and You never really know. I'm sure it's in the millions. Hey, cool stuff, Jack. Again, we'll talk when the next one comes, even though you're not sure it's coming. I know it's coming. So we'll talk soon. Great talking to you again, Mike. Have a good one. Diving into a little bit of a trend-following mindset today, reaching back to my past, not really my past, but just haven't talked to him for a long time, my guest today, Eric Crittenden. Eric is a trend-following trader. He has two-plus decades experience in the space. He's been around the block. He's seen all kinds of stuff, and he has a great perspective. Today, Eric and I take the trend-following philosophy, the managed futures philosophy, ride around the maypole, so to speak. We go everywhere and anywhere. And look, if you're interested in this kind of thinking, this kind of trading, the trend-following mindset, Eric is somebody you need to learn from. Full stop, bottom line, learn something. Now, it's also very cool that Eric has a new fund out right now that happens to have, as the chairman, one Tom Basso. That already tells you that Eric's a pretty smart guy, because if you go out and you get Tom Basso to be the chairman of your firm, you kind of know what's up. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my conversation with Eric Crittenden. Here's where I want to lead off with. I jotted this down and I posted it on Facebook the other day. I don't know where it came from. I think I was just getting tired of watching emotional thinking. And I'm not saying there's something wrong with emotions. I mean, we all have our own emotions for different issues, et cetera. But just the nonstop emotional thinking, it seems like we've, we've kind of gone backwards in the American push forward. And I jotted this down. I said, this is my process. And I just want to kind of open it up to you and you can pick what you like or don't like and we can run with it. But I said, this is my process. Number one, to critically think. Number two, to expose logical fallacies. Number three, to obliterate hypocrisy. Number four, to destroy sacred cows. Number five, to laugh at team or partisan views. Number six, to rip histrionics. Number seven, to nail emotional persuaders. And number eight, to firebomb identity politics. And I didn't think those were necessarily controversial. I just thought they were kind of like just getting us to the point of thinking. Haven't we lost something in the last bunch of years where thinking is not in vogue anymore? A safe place to take that would be to talk about why. Why do all those things? Did you like them? Yes, absolutely. But they're hot button things. So people, when they hear that, they hear accusations, they hear criticism, and they immediately go into defensive mode and they dig in and entrench and they're ready for war. But if you skip all that and you just go to the why part, you start presenting a vision of getting stuff done. And then so you tie those things to an outcome that most people would like. You can tell someone they have bad breath in a way that gets you punched in the face, or you could tell someone they have bad breath in a way that makes you a friend for life. It's the same information. Why do you get such different outcomes? It's on them. It's a real challenge today, though, whether you're in business or whether you want to persuade a friend, because sometimes if you make it too 
weak need, so to speak, or you don't get the point across. Maybe they don't understand the conviction of it. So it's this fine line of, as you say with the bad breath example, going too far or going too little. Yeah. And what I've found is that I call it a sales process, but it's really just a consensus process. Regardless of whether we want it to be this way or not, it happens in stages, meaning you can't meet someone, have one conversation and change their mind unless they're very impressionable. It's unfortunate, but the sales cycle for changing someone's mind or getting them to see things a different way goes through very predictable stages that hinge upon trust and credibility and outcomes. You can't get it done in one conversation. So that's a little bit of an answer to your question. What's changed? Well, we're in a cycle where everything is supposed to be instant. That's what social media does. Social media is junk food for the mind. It brings out the worst in everyone, and it doesn't allow for what I am suggesting is necessary for true communication. Let me keep it at critical thinking for a moment. I know this is near and dear to you. If I just say that, that I'd like to see people critically think more or even just learn how to do it from the start. Maybe they don't even go that way. Maybe they don't understand it. How would you, in your own mind, when you hear the phrase critically think, what would you say to people? How would you explain that? Why is it important to you? Let me tell you what goes through my mind when you say it. What goes through my mind, and I know what critical thinking is. I studied it for a while in school. It's probably the second most important topic, in my opinion, that I covered in school. When you say it, I actually don't know what you mean. I'm not sure what your definition of think critically is in this context. So if I'm a defensive person, or if I have something to lose, or if I'm skeptical of you, my connotation around that is going to start off being negative. And if you combine that with the social media instant gratification environment we have, I feel like we just naturally go down the wrong path. To answer your question, though, I think showing people what you mean rather than saying it has a chance of working. And that's, again, we're back to the sales cycle where it requires trust, credibility, and multiple conversations, unfortunately. Are you implying that I might possibly want to start a firebomb at the beginning of the conversation to get people riled up? Are you trying to possibly say that could be part of my style occasionally? <laughs> it's worked for you in the past. It's not a bad thing. It can be a good thing because like you said before, you've got to get people's attention at some point. And we all have to please our base at some point if you want to be influential. The question is, what are you trying to get out of the conversation? Yeah, I think for me, if I use it and we just keep going where you're asking me, I want to break things down. So if I throw that across the plate to critically think about whatever issue, my point is to start to reduce things to some level to where we can look at the component parts to where there's no emotion around the component parts. But I find if people are scared, you ultimately have a very hard time getting down to that level. Now, people that are curious are kind of like, ooh, that's cool. Let's dive in. I'm curious. Let's break it apart. Let's rip that toy apart and find the motor and see how it works and get to the magnets. But a lot of people don't want to go that path. Yeah. Well, again, it depends on your audience and your motivation, what you're trying to achieve. If I'm facing a hostile audience, I tend to invert things and start with the ending and work backwards. That kind of throws them for a loop and forces them for a period of time to be objective and open-minded. So you can get your points across in a stealth manner that kind of evades their defenses until the smartest ones start to catch on. That's pretty effective. I call it inverting. Charlie Munger at Berkshire Hathaway is a master at doing that, always inverting and start from the end and work from right to left rather than left to right. Because if you go left to right, they see you coming from a mile away. So you and I have been at this for a long time, and this would be trend-following, managed futures. Let's use that as an example. You've got the hostile audience in front of you. Let's say they're pretty bright. They've been exposed to markets. They've been exposed to investing. But they're hearing you for the first time, and they're not familiar with managed futures or trend-following. And you need to start with perhaps the outcome. How do you walk them back? Because once they hear it, they're kind of like, oh, wow, okay, if I take that in to my all stocks portfolio and I add this investment stream that Eric is talking about, I get something that possibly increases the return and possibly reduces the risk. When they hear that outcome, they like that. But taking them back in time to get to the how it all works is tricky, huh? Yeah, it can be, sure. I've had some pretty meaningful success 
That's a good example, the trend following. You outlined a group of people that don't know what it is, but even more difficult is a group of people that know what it is and have already decided that they don't like it or don't want it. Use the ones they know what it is, but they don't like it. Right. I recently put a video out on YouTube called the Blind Taste Test, and that's one of my favorite tools for getting through to people that don't like managed futures. And it's real simple. All I do is anonymize a bunch of different asset classes, strip the title away and just give them color codes. So stocks might be red, bonds might be yellow, managed futures might be pink, a combination of bonds and stocks might be blue, and then a combination of managed futures and stocks might be orange, I think. Don't tell them what it is, though, and have them go through the calendar year returns and look at the total return and look at the volatility and look at the number of down years and the drawdown and whatnot. Just ask them to indicate to you which one they gravitate towards and, and which ones do they gravitate away from. Let them make their choice in an objective manner. So it's kind of like the old blind taste test between Pepsi and Coke. Of course, I already know what the answer is because I've done this hundreds of times. Overwhelmingly, people choose the blend that includes managed futures and stocks together. And when I ask them to eliminate an asset class, not knowing what they are, overwhelmingly people choose to eliminate stocks on a standalone basis because they've got the highest drawdowns and volatility. So then later on, when I reveal to them what they chose, a lot of surprise. Some people are incredulous. They can't believe it. Some people get a little bit upset, but they cannot overlook the fact that when they were objective, they chose 50% trend following managed futures. So I've got that. So I've got a toehold, a foothold. And it's amazing. Even people that are in the business of writing articles that are critical of managed futures are now to some degree open-minded and curious about why when they were forced to be objective, they chose managed futures. Now that's more than you would ever get if you just walked in and said, hey, I'm a managed futures guy, started talking about alpha and co-integration and covariance, diversification and all that stuff, you would get zero out of that. As you use that example, I have to go back in time to share something with you. Seventh grade for me, I won the science fair at my school. And when we set up for the science fair, I was right next to a friend of mine he went on to become an ER surgeon. Everyone knew he was going to be a surgeon when he was in seventh grade. He was a very smart guy, and everyone just knew he was going down that path. He did this whole blind taste test thing. Everyone was just like, wow, he's going to win. Now, me, I had a father who was a dentist, and I was seeing all these fantastic pictures of periodontal disease, basically people's gums rotting away. So I sat down and I just made this great presentation about periodontal disease. And I had pictures that no one else in seventh grade had. Guess who won the science fair? I won the science fair. In some ways, it's kind of almost dovetails in what you're talking about. Like, you know, you do all the research, even you can show all the blind taste tests. But then the guy standing over there with all the crazy pictures and the crazy story gets the attention and gets all the adulation. Lures work the shock value. You're basically meeting some unmet need in the marketplace at that point, And it was probably entertainment for your audience at the time. And there's something to be said for that. I want to give you a quote. This is from Sam Harris. And I think it also dovetails into perhaps why those people that know about managed futures or trend following and when they know about it, and they still have no interest in this quote from Sam Harris. Let's do our best not to mistake psychological problems for philosophical problems. There is a lot of psychology as to why someone that knows about managed futures really doesn't want to go there. I mean, what is that deep-seated issue? I mean, you and I have been at this for decades. We know what the deal is. I mean, the math, it's not high-level math when you take the riskier investment. I mean, not risky in comparatively, but just if you add something in with a different return stream to the stocks and bonds portfolio, you get something that's kind of cool. The math is quite simple. It's very clever. It's interesting. It's nice. It's neat. But man, people are got some real psychological hangups with it, don't they? Yeah, it's amazing. That's one of the, my favorite topics. Cognitive psychology is so crucially important in our business, but I feel like most participants approach it in the wrong way. They just naturally fall into kind of an adversarial posture and start preaching to people, which can be effective if you want a lot of hits on your Twitter feed. But when you're managing other people's money, it's not the greatest way to forge a relationship with them. So I've been forced to take a different approach. 
I say force, but it's not hard for me to take a different approach because I'm not really a conflict guy. There's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot going on. Let's try to keep this simple and focus on the parts that really matter. A big chunk of the resistance is social in nature, meaning that our industry is full of risk averse people that don't want to take career risk. There are norms out there. Stocks are totally acceptable to put up to 60, 70% of people's money in stocks. It's completely acceptable. You don't need to justify anything. Bonds are completely socially acceptable as well. Bonds get a free pass. They can be uncorrelated with stocks all day, every day, or they can become correlated. You're never going to get in trouble for owning risk-free or investment-grade bonds. They get a free pass. I could create something that looks almost identical to bonds, but if it's not bonds, you're going to have trouble as soon as it's down in a year when the stock market's up. That is just pure social and political pressure of managing money for other people. You're very familiar with it. You've been talking about it for decades. It's that fear of deviating from the benchmark. So that's one thing that you have to overcome. And I've been at this for 20 plus years now, and I look at how everyone tries to overcome it, and I just am not enthusiastic about how they try to do that. So I'm trying a different approach. That's one thing, the social and the political aspect. Equally as interesting, though, is the counterintuitive nature of how things affect portfolio returns. Portfolio math is one of the most misunderstood things in the world. You alluded to this a little bit when you talked about taking a volatile but uncorrelated asset that on a standalone basis isn't very desirable. Thank you for correcting me. I should have said volatile instead of risky. Right. Well, same thing in most people's lexicon. I understood what you meant there. So let's say I created something that's very volatile, doesn't look great on a standalone basis, but when you add it into a stock-heavy portfolio, boy, does it change everything. It creates a very stable, balanced, compounding machine that's kind of inoculated to most different kind of market environments. It has you prepared for inflation, deflation, market crashes, all kinds of stuff. And you'd think, well, everyone's going to want this. This is going to be awesome. You see this in some of the tail risk hedging products that are starting to become a little bit popular out there. But good luck trying to get people to buy it and be happy with it. Why? Because they don't evaluate it based upon its contribution to the portfolio over a long period of time. Instead, they carve it out and they evaluate it on a standalone basis. What that does is it maximizes the social and the political stuff we just talked about. They don't understand that that's the wrong way to evaluate this. It's an ingredient in a dish. You don't want to eat a mouthful of cinnamon because that's not so great. But if you add it to the dish, maybe it makes the dish great. Yeah. The funny thing is though, and I'm going to go out and grab an outlier grab a firm that's been around for a long time. If I look at that little firm down there in Stewart, Florida with the 46-year track record, as a standalone, the done return is always something that's quite interesting to look at. You make a wise point that people, not only do they miss, they miss the idea of adding it in and they want to judge it as a standalone, but on the flip side, if one is just objectively looking at data, one can find data that says as a standalone, it's viable. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good case. Those are really smart guys down there and they're purists, meaning that they believe in what they do and and you have to believe in what you do in order to stick it out. And they don't want to dilute it. Those guys, I don't think would ever do what I'm doing, which is to mix managed futures with other asset classes. And I respect that, but they're in a position to do that for a living. Those guys are probably very independently wealthy. They've been incredibly successful over the long term. I look at it a little differently and say, my job is to meet an unmet need in the marketplace. And when I listen to advisors, when I stop talking at them and I start listening to them and we get past all the fluff, I want a sharp ratio of three, no down year, stuff like that. When they get reasonable and start talking about things that are realistic, it's not that hard. What they want is something that doesn't fall too far behind traditional investments during runaway bull markets, but can still hold up pretty well in hostile market environments. And what that is just screaming at me, what they want is managed futures mixed with stocks intelligently. They want reasonable fees. They want reasonable taxes. And what they want is what I do with my own money. That's how I invest. There's a reason for that. I respect the people that want to be purists. I'm just doing something a little different. And I think there's room for all of us. Let me get you to talk about your time at this. And I don't think I've ever asked this question 
the way that I'm going to try to ask it. But as you say, as I know, you've been involved in this for 20 plus years. You are talking to me right now as the head of the firm. You're talking to me as a socially engaging guy. But I don't want people to misunderstand because at the heart of you is a guy that knows systems, you know data, you know code. I mean, you've been in the bowels of the beast for a long time, much longer than I have in terms of like really the nitty nitty gritty. Speak to time if you can, like how much time and effort have you spent at this nitty gritty level of testing, the putting together, the comparing, the contrasting, the working on systems. This is a long time, Eric. Yeah. And I have a love-hate relationship with it. I would say my first exposure to system design was, I think it was 1997 and it was in college. And I've always been a data guy. I studied meteorology and science before switching to finance. I just love dynamic, complex systems where the rule of survival is understanding unintended consequences and nonlinear relationships and how you can remove one species from an ecosystem and crash the whole ecosystem and how that's very counterintuitive. It was a natural fit for me to come into the capital markets because I think they're the ultimate nonlinear complex system fraught with unintended consequences and misunderstandings. Early in college, when I switched from the natural sciences over to finance, I immediately gravitated towards the data, database design, data collection, data cleaning, and data modeling aspect of it all. That was a very humbling experience. I told you this story a long time ago. I don't know if it was in one of our previous podcasts, but the first mechanical system that I ever designed bought 52-week lows and sold 52-week highs, the very opposite of trend following. And the back test was amazing, absolutely amazing. And my ego ran wild. I was already pricing my own private island. I thought I was going to make a fortune. Now, part of that class was to run your mechanical trading system for a semester, and that factored into your grade. So when I ran it, it did nothing but lose money. I thought, wow, am I the most unlucky guy on the planet? What's happening here? But here's the thing. When I reran the back test, it kept making money. So the back test is telling me it's making money, but in real life with my paper trading account, it's actually losing money. Aha, that's not failure to me. That's an opportunity to learn something very, very important. So when I dug deeper and it took me a few days to really go through all the accounting and go through the trade signals and look at it, what I realized is that, oh, this is what they call survivorship bias. I call it post-dictive error as well. In real life, you're buying stocks, they're going to zero. They're on their way to bankruptcy, but as soon as they get delisted, they disappear from the database. So they don't show up in your back test anymore. And likewise, when you're shorting stocks that are getting bought out in real life, losing tons of money as they go higher and higher, as soon as they get bought out, they get delisted and they disappear from the database. So at any point in time, if you just grab a database and you run a bunch of back tests on it, you're only seeing about half the stocks because half the stocks, the other half get delisted for either from bankruptcy or buyouts. Well, what do those two categories have in common? Trends. Stocks that are going bankrupt trend lower and lower and lower, and stocks that are getting bought out tend to trend higher and get bought out at an all-time high. So you're missing that dispersion. You're missing the tails from the database unless you know what you're doing and you do all the grinding hard work to collect all the corporate actions, all the delisted stocks. It's very expensive. It's very time-consuming. No one wants to do it. But if you want to model history as it actually unfolded through time, you have to do that kind of work. I guess what I'm saying is that's a skill set that you have to have as a systems guy. And it's not rewarding and no one ever wants to talk about it. And it's certainly not going to show up in your marketing materials, but you have to do it if you're going to have a chance. I can relate to that in a different way with a different set of data. I recall perhaps in the early 90s, seeing all this managed futures trend following data from different managers, different traders, unaffiliated with each other. And I didn't really see any of this research. It didn't seem terribly complicated to me, but I was unable to find at that time the research or the data or the other people's opinions that verified what I was seeing in the data. And what I was seeing was, well, this is really interesting. I've got 10 or 15 traders here. They're all unaffiliated and they're all making and losing money in the same months. And they are in some cases, making and losing 
very comparable amounts of money in the same months. And I was like, well, that's really interesting. These guys are not part of the same company. They're unaffiliated. It just was such an eye opener. And I'm relating it to what you're saying is that when you get into whatever data set you're looking at, and if you kind of really assume that perhaps not everything has been done and you get into it and you look at it yourself and then that aha moment happens and then you're like, well, hold on. Why is the rest of the world not talking about this? I'm not really sure why it doesn't get more attention. I've blogged about it in the past. I've written papers about it in the past. And I seem to get a lot of positive feedback, but it's from a small group of people that have interests similar to my own that find it very helpful and useful. But in the grand scheme of things, I think that's just too boring and it's too much homework for most investors. I mean, look, you brought this up a couple moments ago. It's been 20 years. I learn something new, something important every year, but it's full-time workload. And I happen to be very interested in this stuff. And I do not begrudge the other people in this world that have full lives. They're running companies. They have families. They're buying real estate. They're doing stuff. There's no way they could ever carve out enough time to drill down into the guts of the data and understand these truisms. They can listen. And I try to do a good job of breaking it down into the four or five really important things. And I've had some success with that. But we can't expect people to wait 10, 15, 20 years to pull it all together to be as comfortable as you and I are with these concepts. Yeah. I mean, maybe sometimes if we look back, we were just too young and too early. And it takes a long time when you have a big system on the other side, which is a lot of career risk. And you did not talk about this part of the career risk, but a lot of folks make a lot of money doing something entirely different. There's a lot of fees to be paid for putting people into bad buy and hold mutual funds, right? Yes. It's a buzzsaw. It's an industry and it's an old and big industry. Breaking in and doing something different forces everyone in that ecosystem to alter their behavior a little bit. So it's not the most welcoming experience to launch an alternative investment in the ETF world or the mutual fund world. But that's where there's room. There's an unmet need in that world. I don't feel like there's an unmet need in the CTA or the hedge fund world because there's already a lot of good product over there. So you just have to figure out a way to do it. But you're right. You're rocking the boat for some people. So you have to be real nice because <laughs> you can't pay them. With the fiduciary rule and all that stuff, the ability to pay people has kind of gone away. So there's just a lot of disruption and changes afoot right now that make it important to be nimble and be open-minded and pivot when necessary. Let's speak to diversification. And when people start to understand, of course, you're blending stocks and managed futures in your vehicle. But if we talk about the managed futures side of it, the trend following side of it, and diversification comes up, and let's say you are speaking to a non-advisor audience, you got doctors and attorneys in the audience, and you, Eric, stand up and you talk about the size of your firm. It's not a huge number of people, not necessarily needed. And you start to talk about this increased diversification. Okay, everyone in the audience, they kind of get, okay, stocks, bonds. This guy's probably studying the fundamentals and whatnot. But then you start to talk about your ability to trade commodities and currencies, uh, different geographic areas. And people start to think, well, hold on. How in the hell does that guy have the skill or the knowledge, the foresight to trade all of these different types of instruments, markets across the globe? I mean, what has he got a secret room full of great fundamental minds that can tell him where the oil tankers are on the high seas? I mean, how is he pulling this off? I mean, look, you and I know where I'm going here, but it is still something that I think people can't wrap their arms around. How does that guy, Eric, have the skill to trade all of those markets? Yeah. So I've come across this several times in the past where when people find out initially that we're trading 60, 70, 80 different global futures markets, one of the first things they ask is, well, who's in charge of cattle? Who's in charge of soybeans? And who analyzes corn? So on and so forth. They believe that you have to have some sort of a fundamental opinion on these things in order to participate in them. And I've tried different approaches at answering that in the past. And the most successful one was, again, just invert the whole conversation and say, show them the results of just a systematic rules-based approach to participating in all these different markets first. 
and then work backwards from that. Reverse engineer it with them. Yes, exactly. So instead of making excuses as to why you don't have 70 staff people running different desks and whatnot, instead of saying, hey, you don't need to know the fundamentals in order to make money in these markets, simply show them what it looks like if you just have a rules-based process that is standardized and applied equally across all your different markets. And that's a big eye-opener to people, a big eye-opener. Now, naturally, they're kind of skeptical about it because what goes through their mind is, oh, well, how much better would it be if you were an expert in corn and if you did have an expert in wheat and you did have an expert in silver? To that, I respond, well, is the S&P 500 an expert in any sector or any individual company? No. The Russell 3000? No. Do those things beat virtually all active managers? Yes. Why is that? And then we get into a discussion about that and they start to realize that, well, maybe those glossy marketing decks that they get from old school mutual funds about all the CFA studying all the fundamentals, maybe that's not worth very much. And you'll find a pretty receptive audience after you go down. I tend to go down both of those roads. It doesn't come up that much anymore. I think because managed features has actually started to become an asset class for people. Whereas 10 years ago, when I first started penetrating the mutual fund market, people didn't even know what managed features was. Let me get deep on you for a second, or maybe it won't be deep. Maybe it's just on the surface. And I'm not being religious when I say this, but I want to quote a Zen proverb. I find more and more, and I follow a couple Zen feeds on Twitter, I can literally sit and read Zen quotations. Five out of 10 of them seem to be specifically written from managed futures trend following. It's like, <laughs> what were these guys doing 2,000 years ago? Do they know about trend following? Look, here's one. High understanding comes from not understanding at all. Hmm. Can you elaborate on that? What does it mean to you? It gets right to the fundamentals. I mean, if you admit, I really don't understand the fundamentals, and look, the fundamentals go on forever. There can be innumerable data sets. So if you just kind of admit that my high understanding comes from not understanding the fundamentals, once you admit that you don't understand the fundamentals, what's left? What other ways can we look at this scenario of not being able to understand the fundamentals and come to a higher level understanding? And for me, I immediately go to, well, gosh, if I can't understand all the fundamentals and none of us can, then what's left? What's interesting? What could possibly be useful? And you were just describing a system which ultimately relies on something like price data. It's an entirely different way of looking at something. And then you come to this high level understanding. At least that's how my brain works. I agree with you. But the way I would try to get somebody to see the wisdom in that. Not give them Zen proverbs? <laughs> well, no, I like them. And my favorite book is Aesop's Fables. And I think most of those are applicable to managed futures trend following. <laughs> Same thing, right? Let me think about this for a second. This is a very important point. It's really hard to overcome the natural inclination of people that more information is better, that you have to do your homework, that you got to know your stuff. What you're saying is, how do I get them to accept that that's mostly noise? And if you're a human being, you're probably going to use all that information incorrectly and screw the trade up or screw the investment up anyways. I tend to try to give people examples. I like to use sports analogies quite a bit, and I haven't been watching sports this year, but in years past, I would ask him a question like, if the Seahawks were playing the Cardinals, who do you think would win that game in a year when the Seahawks were a much better team than the Cardinals, which is most years? People would say, oh, clearly the Seahawks. And I said, okay, all right. What if the line was four and a half points, though? Then they would have to think about it some more. And they're like, well, hold on, wait a minute. And where do they go? They go immediately to the fundamentals and they start the talking about the players and this guy is coming back from an injury, yada, yada, yada. They go through all that stuff. And then I tell them, well, don't you think that's all already priced into the line? Don't you think that the collective wisdom of all the participants and the lines makers and the bookies and Vegas and Fox Sports and all those people have probably done a better job than you at setting the line? What if it went to five and a half or what if it went to seven and a half? Well, then they would say, well, something clearly changed, but you didn't know what that change was going to be, but you trust the line. You think it's probably fair. Now they're starting to wrap their head around what we call a discounting mechanism. So when a discounting mechanism runs away from you, it doesn't care how good of a job you do analyzing the fundamentals. It's factoring them in in real, in real time with real money in real life. 
And unless you're just better than the collective wisdom of everyone else, a lot better, meaning you got to overcome taxes, transaction costs, the overhead of doing all the research and whatnot, unless you're a lot better, fundamental analysis is probably not going to help you very much. So when I explain it to people like that, they grudgingly, sometimes grudgingly say, that makes a lot of sense. I can see that. Now, it's still leaving a hole in their knowledge base. Like, okay, well, if you can't rely on that, what do you do? That's a bigger topic. And I'm sure that we could, if we dig in, the biggest sports players in Vegas that are running, quote, sports funds, you just know it's all quant. You know it's all coded. I mean, those guys, they might give out this Jimmy the Greek aura that we're these oracles that can look into the ball. But you know behind the scenes, they've got it all coded, and it's a quant system, probably not too much different than what you do. Let me tell you a brief story. You'll really like this one, Mike. I'm such a data nerd. I used to have access to the sports databases, and I don't gamble. I've never gambled in my life except once when I was 18. But I downloaded all the statistics from basketball and baseball. And I put them into a database and then I created a really simple trend following system on futures and I recorded the trades and then I plotted them in a cumulative probability distribution and I put all three of them side by side by side and I asked people to tell me which one's baseball and I used pitchers, I used batting average, I used on base percentage, power hitting and then on basketball I did rebounds, steals, a whole bunch of different stuffs and by player, by team and then over time. Nobody could differentiate between them. Fat tails, streaks, runs, trends, you name it. They couldn't tell the difference. I couldn't tell the difference. It's just a fact of life. That's how competition creates tails, runs, and trends. It's a fact of life. I've never gambled at all. So you've got one up on me. And I've been all over Vegas and all over Macau, Singapore, etc. The only thing that I want to do at some point in time, and I was offered this by guy who was on this podcast, MIT, blackjack team leader, still operating, I believe, but he offered that if I was game at some point in time, I think it was called the gorilla role in the team structure for blackjack. And he was just kind of, he was saying, you know, you might have to come play the gorilla role one time, which is the kind of the guy that's really not a part of the whole thing, but it's just betting really heavy when the team has got the odds on their side. He just wanted me to kind of see how the process went down. I've not done it yet, but I'm going to have to take him up on it one day. There's a lot of parallels between gambling, sports betting, and systematic trading. There's a lot of parallels, but there's one big difference that means the world to me. One's accretive to the economy and society, and one's not. One's parasitic. In a sense. I'm not passing judgment here. I'm just saying that that part's important to me. Trading futures is a way to express an opinion, set up an asymmetric bet, and provide liquidity to commercial hedgers in their time of need. And in return, theoretically, in my mind, you're entitled to a sustainable risk premium for doing that part. And if they lose on the trade to you, you win, and they win as well, because that trade that they put on is heavily negatively correlated to some risk on their balance sheet that they were trying to get rid of, which gave them the confidence to use leverage in their business or expand their business and whatnot. So that's a symbiotic, mutualistic type relationship between trend followers and hedgers. And I think that's why it persists over time and why it's worked for 50 years. You're such a nice guy to not pass judgment, though. I can think of all the times I was in Vegas casinos eating or having fun, not gambling, but seeing all those old folks sitting at those slot machines, so depressingly sad, just blowing their time and money. Or I can think to having an interview years ago with a young man outside the lottery offices in Richmond, Virginia, with cameras on him. And he was a very wide-eyed guy, worked for the government. And he actually sat there and told me with a straight face that he played the lottery because this was a useful strategy for his retirement. And he was very serious. He really thought the math was on his side, that if he kept playing the lottery, he could get to retirement. So I think in that way, it's very insidious that some of these things, and I know you believe that you just didn't want to go there, but I mean, seeing what, look, I'm very libertarian about this. If people want to play the lottery, fine. If they want to do gambling, fine. I'm a little less happy about the fact that government gets people addicted to the lottery. If people want to go to Vegas of their own free will and have fun, that's quite different in my opinion. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm not approving of it. In fact, back when I was a teacher in the late nineties, I taught business math. 
and intro to computer science. Those are the two classes I taught. And in both of them, the first lesson that I taught my students was gambler's fallacy. In business math, we just went through the math on, back then we used overhead projectors (laughs) and chalkboards. I would teach them gambler's fallacy. And then in intro to computer science, the first program that we wrote was one where they couldn't help but recognize that this, because everyone falls for gambler's fallacy at first. That guy with the lottery tickets probably thought by playing the same numbers over and over, eventually he had to be right. That's gambler's fallacy. There are ways to kind of mix concepts together that it can educate in two ways at the same time. I was trying to figure this out by myself the other day, just a new way to think about it. So I'm going to ask you for your preferred way to think about it. If we talk about the managed futures trend following side of your fund, and you want people to understand the notion of an opportunity, and we're starting off the year January 1st, what so many people, when they think about investments, they think about something consistent. This year, this market, they build in these expectations that, that something will happen. Whereas when you look at your managed futures side of your business, you don't know what's going to be the result for the given year. You can't predict which markets will give you gain or loss. You don't know. And I think we've hinted at this and talked about this in this conversation so far, but when you very specifically look at it, the beginning of the year, here we are starting, the managed futures side of our biz, we don't know where we're possibly going to get gains or losses. How do you explain that to people? I have a couple of different approaches. One, I'm very candid with people about that. I think it's important to know that. I like to use metaphors and analogies to drive the point home. So I have the venture capital analogy where I say, look, I lived in Silicon Valley for eight years. I know people that work there. I have a pretty good understanding of how the venture capital, at least the payoff structure works. And if you talk to these guys off the record, they have no idea which of the 50 startups they're investing in is going to work out. They're basically making the bet that one or two of them are going to be hundred baggers and the rest of them, you're going to lose every penny you put into them. And that's what the data says consistently happens time and time again. It's a tiny minority are responsible for all the gains. So you have to hold strong that minority when they're working out and limit your losses on the other ones that don't work out. That's just the way it works. And if they're being honest with you, they'll tell you that's how it works. The sports analogy I like to use, say NFL draft. How many times has your favorite team picked someone in the first round, the second round, the third round that turn out to be busts? If you evaluate every NFL draft pick that has ever been placed, I think the highest value is the late second round, early third round. Because the first round guys, you're paying them a ton of money. But on a price performance, overwhelming majority of the value comes out of the late second, early third round. And that's somewhat counterintuitive. But when you draft all these guys, you really just have no clue which one of them is going to turn into a superstar and which isn't. The data basically says random selections (laughs) just based upon the metrics are probably more effective than the intuition that most of these GMs and coaches put into drafting. With the exception of the Seahawks, those guys have done something. They've rocked the boat a bit with their drafts. I'm not sure if it's luck or, or skill. Random selections that can cause people just to spin. But it's so cool when you bring the metaphor analogy to venture capital, Silicon Valley to sports. And if people are open to that, okay, I understand venture capital. That's easy to understand. There was a zillion search engines, Google One. People can grasp that. They can get your point about what you just laid out about the draft. That makes sense. So if you take that mindset and you say, hey, There's a lot of markets to be traded out there. What if you think like that and take that thinking and bring it over here to Mr. Market? How cool is that? For you and I, we probably still think it's cool even after all these years we first discovered it. It boils down to what I tell people is that we believe in our process. It is somewhat like venture capital. We don't know if soybeans are going to have a supply-demand disruption and soar or tank. We don't know if silver is going to be a big winner or German bonds are going to be. We don't know ahead of time, but we do believe in our process. And our process is to buy breakouts, short sell breakdowns, budget our risk for that particular trade contingent upon what's going on in the portfolio, and then have the discipline to cut it if it turns into a loss and just wash, rinse, repeat, keep repeating that over and over and over again. If they're still confused 
about that. And most people get it and they think, okay, well, I'd like to see that work for a period of time. And then they like to look at the performance attribution and see, oh yeah, you're right. 80% of your gains comes from 20% of your trades. Well, it'd be great if you could identify that 20% in advance. And I say, yeah, it would be great, but then I would have all the money in the world. So obviously that's not realistic. I just explained to him that the S&P 500 is a big, dumb trend following system. It's just super slow moving and it's very tax efficient and it's very transaction cost efficient. But the bigger the company gets, the higher the weighting. If the company goes down, if it starts trending down, when it gets rebalanced to a lower weighting and eventually kicked out. If you believe in the stock market, which for most people, they define that as the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000, they already believe in a trend following system. Let's talk big picture. Let's talk about the need for what you and I are talking about in this conversation. Has anything changed in the last 20 years? I mean, the whole point of what we're talking about is that you and I don't have a crystal ball. But structurally, has the Fed taken actions? Have there been government actions? Has there been a new bias? Has there been a psychological breakdown? Is something different at this point in history are we facing a change or is it still just how it always has been and this kind of putting yourself in a position to benefit when the new opportunities or the quote black swans perhaps swim in it's always been there or are we facing something different you see where i'm going i do i wish i could say no i'd love to be able to say no nothing's changed we're just going to keep doing what we're doing but that's not true the current interest rate levels are a game changer relative to anything that we've seen in modern history. I recently did a project for a client where I did a Monte Carlo simulation of pretty much all the possible future paths that interest rates could take going forward. And I showed what the corresponding returns would be for different kinds of bonds. The idea here was to, because people can visualize interest rates are going to soar. They can visualize that or interest rates are going to go negative they Can visualize that or interest rates are going to go sideways or everything in between all these different permutations up and then down, down, then up sideways for a while and then up so on and so forth. But what they don't know is well, what's a likely return for my bond portfolio. A lot of the money in America and the world is invested in these bonds. That's kind of the risk management for most traditional portfolios is the 30, 40, 50% allocation to bonds. And it was very interesting to look at the results because they're bad. <laughs> they're really bad. Very few of them include positive rates of return going forward. It's not that hard to see why. With the yields right now, I think it's maybe 70 basis points on the U.S. 10-year treasury. Let's just use that as a proxy for the whole bond market. Historically, your return from investing in bonds, almost all of it comes from the yield component. The capital gains can seem meaningful at times, but over a long term, they average out to about zero. In fact, you can just use the current yield as a pretty accurate predictor of what you're going to get as an annualized compounded return for the 10-year bond if you hold it for 10 years and you roll it. And then if you factor in an advisory fee of 1%, most advisors are charging about 1%, you have a pretty significantly negative expected return on the bonds. And then if you factor in inflation, even if you use half the historical rate, so you only put inflation in there at maybe 1.5%, you're looking at negative 3 to 5% annualized returns. That's kind of the median result from all these different Monte Carlo simulations. So I decided to isolate, just show me the permutations that actually made money. And it was less than 3% of the permutations or the outcomes actually had any investors making a positive real rate of return over the next 10 years in almost all investment grade bonds, including treasuries. That's a big deal. I can't go back in history and see a time where that was our reality. And like I said, that's a huge chunk of the money out there. Here's the other thing. People have become accustomed to bonds being an effective hedge. Every time the stock market goes down meaningfully, their bonds, they expect their risk-free and their government bonds to rally. We're starting to see that wane. It's becoming less and less true over time. And most people are too young to realize that bonds were positively correlated with stocks prior to the 1990s. Not negatively correlated. They weren't a great hedge. They were a decent hedge, but they weren't great. And I'm starting to see the correlations between bonds and stocks creep up. Every quarter, it gets a little bit higher. 
you combine those two things together and you have the fuel for an epic disaster going forward where people are going to get results that are so far outside of what they're expecting that I foresee fireworks on the horizon. So it's part of the motivation for doing what I'm doing, because if you can't trust bonds, what else is there that's an effective diversifier to equities? It's pretty slim pickings. Some people can make a case for gold, and it's been reasonably effective as a diversifier, but not always. Sometimes it just goes straight down with stocks. MLPs are somewhat uncorrelated with stocks, but not the greatest diversifier, at least not during really hostile market conditions. Managed futures has kind of been the best diversifier from my perspective. Over the last 50 years, it's been even more effective than bonds. And I don't see managed futures being hamstrung the way bonds are right now. So basically what I'm saying is that people should be more enthusiastic about managed futures right now than they've ever been because it has the very real potential of solving that terrible problem that no one seems to be taking very seriously. But managed futures is as out of favor as I've ever seen it right now, which is kind of poetic, but that's where we are. As I think about what you're saying, it takes me back to a memory, 1997, 1998, talking with my CPA first getting businesses going. And I remember him saying to me, I was a young guy and not a lot of wealth at that moment in time. And he said, Mike, it's real simple. Just get 2 million free and clear in the bank at 6% interest and you're set. <laughs> that was the 1998 logic. And here we are, here we are in 2020. And that's like some kind of Wizard of Oz fantasy. It's not even imaginable I think there's another issue to what you're bringing up too, is that what happens psychologically as people get older, they no longer have, or it's been taken away from them as they get to retirement, so to speak, they no longer have something that looks simple, that gives them some cash in the bank each month to pay the rent or whatever. We've kind of taken that dog bowl away. And now the choice is, you got to chase something that has a little more volatility, a little more risk, or you're not going to eat, so to speak, as you just lay out with your Monte Carlo simulation. The bond thing's gone. Yeah, it's gone. But still, it's an uphill battle to explain that to people when you go left to right. Like I said before, I tend to go right to left. So instead of talking about managed futures and talking about the problem that it solves, I start from a different perspective and I talk about all weather investing and why I like all weather investing. And I like being prepared and I like something that is stable, not just balance. There's a big difference between stability and balance. Stability is the ability to maintain balance when things change. Balance is just a current state. Someone doing a handstand is currently balanced. Are they stable? Not necessarily. You talk about all weather investing and you talk about having currencies in your portfolio. You talk about having commodities in your portfolio in addition to stocks and bonds, because that's what managed futures is. It's big sustained trends in those four different asset classes. Source those risk premiums in those other two big, deep, liquid capital markets. There are big trends in currencies and they've been there for 50 years. Commodities, that's another symmetrical market where you can make money being short, you can make money being long, you can lose money too. But I think it belongs in the portfolio. There's no reason that it can't be an excellent diversifier in the portfolio. But you start with that all weather approach and you talk about why you do it with your own money and you show what it looks like historically. Case in point, there are some really successful firms out there that follow an all weather approach. Regular everyday investors can do it too. You don't have to just cram it all into stocks and bonds. Now, most people are still going to do that, and I'm okay with that, but there are other options. Congratulations on the setup and the start of the new firm, and congratulations on getting perhaps my most favorite guest on this show, Tom Basso, to serving as your chairman, is he? Yeah, he's the chairman, original investor. I've known Tom for over 20 years. He's a great guy. He, was, he ran a great CTA. He really knows what he's doing, and he's a great addition to the firm. I've learned so much from him over the last 20 years. I don't know if I ever told you the story, but I applied for a job at his firm in 1999. He sent me a rejection letter, and his president, Peter Mothy at the time, separately sent me a rejection letter. And these guys put so much time and effort into their letters. I mean, multiple paragraphs, totally coherent, going through 
all the reasons that you want to avoid building trading systems, focusing on entries, indicators, all that stuff. I mean, these guys really made an investment in me. It was with the greatest letdown I'd ever had. And I took that to heart. And I learned a lot from those guys. They didn't even remember doing it when I moved out to Arizona and ended up meeting them. So yeah, I'm thrilled to have Tom on the team. He knows his stuff. He's got more experience than me. He did it for a long time. He ran a really big CTA back in the 80s, and he's just been a fantastic resource for me. I think he's timeless. I mean, really, I think at the rate he's going, the mindset, the physical way that he keeps himself. And I only met him one time a long time ago. When I get back to the States, I'm going to have to go look him up here in Arizona. And he seems to have gotten a second life here with social media in the sense that so many people are interested and want his insights. So, and it's fantastic that you guys are getting a chance to collaborate and, and pull off the new firm. Yeah, the guy doesn't age. He really does. He looks like he's 40 years old. He's active, plays golf, travels the world. I mean, he's got a great lifestyle. I just hope that <laughs> hope my life can be more like his in the future. Eric, great chatting. We'll have to get a chat in every year or two at the latest. I know it's been a little while since we've chatted on the podcast, but I appreciate you coming on. Is there anything that I missed today that is really near and dear to you? Anything, it could maybe not even directly related to the firm, anything that's when you sit around, you shoot the you know what with folks, what's really getting you beyond what we've talked about today? Is there anything that I've missed? No, I don't think so. One thing that's been on my mind and I thought about bringing up on today's podcast is that there's just so much good stuff hidden in plain sight with social media and anxiety and COVID and chaos and unemployment and social security and politics and whatnot. I feel like people are overlooking the good stuff that's hidden in plain sight more than they have in the past. I'm hoping this is just an episode in our existence and we can move past it. All we can do is take the hand that we're dealt and play it to the best of our ability and trade the right side of the chart. So we just got to move forward and deal with uncertainty. When I talk to people and you get them away from the social media and the politics isn't there, there's a lot of good in the world. I'm a little bit of a cynical guy. Whether I'm talking with really liberal people, really conservative people, there's still just a ton of good out there. And it's just hidden in plain sight. And it's kind of mildly depressing to see what we've deteriorated down into recently in the past couple of years. And I'm hoping that episode passes. And there's some parallels between that and what you and I do for a living. There's a angel investor out there. You might be familiar with him. His name is Naval. And I saw a quote of his the other day on Twitter, and I think it dovetails directly as to where you just went. And his quote is this, the goal of media is to make every problem your problem. And I think that is kind of getting at what you're talking about. In some ways, while you didn't say it, what you're really saying is turn that stuff off. It's all propaganda, so to speak. Turn that off. And then you start to look around, go do your own investigation, do your own art, so to speak. You're probably going to find something a lot more interesting for your life than just taking the pre-programmed stuff, the pre-programmed oatmeal they throw at you every day. If you just kind of look around, you're going to find something probably a lot nicer. You know, I gave up TV a long time. The last TV show I watched was Frasier. I think that was 1998. You just turned 85 years old too, right? (laughs) No, I'm 49, almost. Information is not wisdom. Not all information is useful. And social media is, in my opinion, junk food for the mind to a large degree. Now you can use it for good. Tom uses it for good. Some people use it for good, but it is bringing out the worst in people and not all information is wisdom. You know how I've used it? And I think it's because of where I started. I use it as a blog. I really don't care too much what other people have to say. I might look at some comments here and there. If they're useful, then I learn something. But generally it's my public diary. Whatever I'm interested in, I put it out there. And if people like what I'm saying, that's kind of what an author does, a book or whatnot. But I think a lot of people don't look at it that way. They don't look at it as a way to share information or share insights or share a different way of thinking. They look at it as this kind of insane back and forth, covet thy neighbor routine. And that's where it's really dangerous. I liken it to driving on the freeway. There's a few jerks on the freeway. Most people are just trying to get home or trying to get to work, but builds all this anxiety and brings out the worst in people, the bad behavior we see on the freeway. And my point here is it only takes a few to screw it up for everyone else. And we should just be conscious of that and aware of that. Eric, where can we send people? Standpoint, the company, the firm, the fund, where can we direct people to? 
And our website's a good resource. We're launching a new version of it here pretty soon. There'll be a lot of material on there that I think people that are interested in these concepts would benefit from. And that's standpointfunds.com. Nothing meaningful on there right now, but in the next, I think, three or four weeks, we're going to be updating the website. So that would be one way to get in touch with us. Cool stuff, Eric. Thank you for coming on. I hope, well, you probably expected that I was going to kind of go around the Maypole. You probably had no idea where I was going to go. A typical interview, right? These are your typical interviews with someone like me. Enjoyable for me too. We talk philosophy, we talk substance, we talked about trading and markets and the Fed and interest rates and good coverage. I really appreciate it. It was fun for me. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.